Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Buzzstream Podcast. I'm your host, Vince Nero, and today I'm happy to invite Victoria Schmid, the Senior Digital PR and Influencer Marketing Specialist at Kuru Footwear. So I'd never heard of Kuru before uh, meeting you. I had a chance to check it out. Looks like awesome shoe. I'm sure you have many Kuru shoes. Are you wearing them right now? Yes, definitely. <laughs> You funnily enough have like foot pain, so it kind of works out good for me. I can wear them all the time. Yeah, that seems to be like that. Is that kind of the the value prop with these? Yeah, they're basically Kuru shoes are like orthopedic shoes that aren't meant to look traditionally orthopedic, so you can wear them every day and in a bunch of different you know scenarios like winter boots, sandals, things like that. So yeah, yeah, check it out. I mean, I'll, I'll link to all this stuff, but check it out oh. in the, the show notes. Yeah, they, they got some cool shoes on there. And before we get started, Victoria, I just want to remind all our listeners to like, subscribe, share this podcast with your friends, work colleagues. Um, the more, you know, interaction that we get with this type of stuff, the more I can bring on great guests like Victoria to talk about being digital PR and doing all the great stuff that we do and our guests do. So reminder, smash that like button. <laughs> so uh, Victoria, we talked prior to this, you actually did a case study for us on BuzzStream and that's kind of where I met you. And then we started talking a little bit about your background and, um, you know, working in-house. And there was one specific thing you said to me that really, it stood out because it is a problem that I've seen other people have, and it's very unique to working in-house. So, you know, I think today I'd, I'd like to I talk about the in-house versus agency life, but also like this idea of keeping away from the overly salesy, overly marketing oriented content and, and how it can be really tough to build content in in-house for a product without making it sound too heavily, you know, advertorial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So thank you so much for having me. So just to give a bit of background and introduce myself. I'm Victoria, and as Vin said, I'm currently a digital PR specialist and also an influencer marketing specialist at Kuru. I started digital PR back in 2018. It's crazy. It's been about six and a half years now, and I've mostly done in-house roles with a really short stint and an agency. Um, one thing we were talking about was when I first started in digital PR and I was in-house, I was working for a client or a website that was an internet comparison website. So we weren't, we were selling a product in that we compared internet, but we weren't selling like a physical product. So moving over to Kuru Footwear, where we do have this physical product and we are an e-commerce brand, like there's no stores you can go on, like go into and try the shoes on. Um, it's been really unique and had some really unique challenges around digital PR. Um, and I mentioned to you just kind of offhand that I had been accidentally CC'd in some emails from journalists. I think it was around Black Friday and Christmas last year where I was running this campaign about every state's favorite shoe, or I think it may have even been a survey called the American Footwear Survey where we just wanted to know like, what are Americans' favorite shoes? And we could break it down by state. Sneakers, boots, sandals. Um, and then I even went as granular as just to give myself as many pitching angles as possible, favorite color shoes in every state, average shoe size in every state, um, how many pairs of shoes Americans are in. And yeah, I got accidentally, I guess the journalist hit reply all, which we've all done. And I got this email where they were saying, oh, this looks kind of interesting. Should we cover it? And then another journalist saying, oh no, this just reads like a total ad. And you know, I think at first we all have a bit of an ego and like, I know I really put my heart and soul into every campaign I do and I have like a lot of pride in it. So at first, like that really did kind of hurt my feelings. I was like, oh, that kind of sucks. I'm, I'm kind of bummed that they thought that. Um, but I then took it as a kind of a learning that, you know, getting unfiltered, brutally honest feedback from a journalist is really like a digital PR's dream. Because, you know, I've worked at places where we paid journalists to like give us feedback on our pitches and our ideas. And I just think, yeah, given that, it, I, I had to take a moment and I took a big step back, reassessed all my strategy and said, you know, from a journalist's perspective, why do these read like ads? And 
it's, I kind of forgot to mention this, but I actually started out in broadcast journalism. That's like what I went to university for. And I worked in a newsroom for a bit. And I was literally the person filtering the pictures coming in, reading over them, passing them along to journalists saying, you know, is this something we want to cover? So I, I have to really make some like changes and think, oh gosh, this reads like ads. Like that's so not the goal of link building, right? We want earned media, earned coverage. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how that all came about. Yeah. I mean, having that unfiltered advice or, or, uh, feedback, I guess from a journalist, I mean, I've definitely gotten that before, not from a journalist. I remember pitching somebody, something freelance. This was a long time ago before I even kind of got into digital PR. I was like trying to do social media and somebody CC'd their partner after the pitch and was like, Hey, this guy this guy wasn't that good or so like he sounds too young or something and i was like ah okay all right um but you know it, it's a, their learning experiences which you can take them one way and it sounds like you took it the right way uh which is great and yeah let, let's dig into this a little bit because you know honestly to me that pitch that you're talking about like doesn't sound too advertorial like doesn't sound like in uh, marketing play um you're just getting shoe uh, general like if it was like you know um what do you like about kuru or something <laughs> like which which kuru uh, style do you like but for people that are working in-house and have a let's you know a product i mean i guess it could be a SaaS. it could really be anything how do you ideate so that you don't get too far into it but then not you don't want to get too far away as well. Right. So there's like that, that special kind of middle ground there that you have to hit. It seems pretty challenging. Yeah. So, you know, I went to Brighton SEO last year. I keep on top of a lot of SEO and digital PR industry news. And I think we all know that we're moving to this place where relevancy and campaigns re is really, really important. And that, you know, if I did a digital PR campaign, like I was trying to think of something off the top of my head, even like Every state's favorite Thanksgiving dinner. That really, like, to me is way too far from Kuru footwear, footwear, walking, foot pain, anything like that. So I am in this really tricky spot where I have to find something that's relevant enough so that the link equity and SEO values there. But clearly my stuff that was really close was like too ad um, advertising. So I think... In digital PR, we should always be trying to improve and like make the best campaign and find the campaigns that fit our brand, right? So what I found has really helped is looking at different, um, different things that relate to walking or maybe we have actually a annual report we put out that's very in-depth. It's called like the state of foot pain and mm -hmm. that covers almost all the foot pain stuff, right? We have... Um, podiatrists review it. We have doctors review it. That's like our big report of the year that we're really trying to use to build up credibility as well as backlinks. So I, that, that's almost takes out that whole chunk of foot pain as like a topic. Otherwise it's going to be too repetitive. So I'm trying to find these campaigns that have something to do with our brand that makes sense. So for instance, last year, um, I did a campaign and it was the best dates for hiking and that one really did well. And I think this year, what I did differently was launched it at the same time that we launched a hiking shoe, a new one. Uh, that being that it matches our marketing and editorial calendar really well. And then when I'm pitching people like an outside magazine or people who, you know, do like gear review, those kinds of places, if they reply saying, hey, this isn't really something I'd cover about the best states to hike in, but do you have a shoe we can try? I can then say, hey, yeah, we've actually got this new shoe. Hmm. and send it to them, not in the sense of sending them something like in exchange for a link, but just for those journalists that it is their job to review new gear and post their reviews, right? So it's really about like some campaigns have had a lot of success with uh, the longest and shortest airports or airport walking distances that we mentioned, um, best states for hiking, safest and most dangerous states for or cities for pedestrians. So Things that really relate to walking and being on your feet, but aren't about shoes and foot pain. I almost think shoes and foot pain are like off limits because they are so close to what our brand is selling. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like, well, so I'd say like the foot pain one, like I really like that. Mm -hmm. It almost sounds like 
either it's like activities that you do with shoes, like that you do, and it could be, you know, extrapolate this to other, th- it's like activities that you could do with a product, right? And then also like solutions that your product yep. sells, right? Right. So that's where like the foot payment one, I think makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm curious, like, have you gotten feedback on things being too far away as well? Ooh, that's a really good question. Actually, yes, when I first started, I wanted to do something really different that I'd seen honestly being used mostly by like Rise at 7 about uh, TikTok search data and how I could pitch something different instead of, you know, the Google Trends thing I've been doing since 2018 of this state Googles this the most uh, or this state's favorite X is this. I think that's like a fantastic digital PR recipe. I was thinking, I'm going to try something with TikTok search data. I don't see that so much out there. And I did this campaign about the most searched TikTok workouts because, you know, we do a lot about exercise, being on your feet. And I did actually have a few journalists saying, why does a footwear company care about this? I think that's definitely one of those instances where it was too far from the brand. And I think that's what digital PR is, especially at in-house. I basically do one campaign per month, sometimes two, like a new campaign. And I look at it as every oppor- like every month is a new opportunity to say, how can I get either closer or learn something <laughs> about how to get this brand, like how to get links and like brand mentions and um, brand awareness, but without being too far from it. So I definitely have had that. Like, I think any good digital PR, like no one's going to get it perfect the first time and you should always be looking to improve that. So yeah, I would definitely say I make mistakes and I just take it and take it to the next thing and think, all right, TikTok workouts, way too far from what we <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, we used to have like a kind of like these like post-mortem meetings with mm-hmm. when I worked at Siege Media, I was like, we go over every client and just, you know, what did we do wrong? What, like, why did this work? Why did this not work? And see what we could apply to other clients. You mentioned something interesting there too, like it's got me thinking about your your job in general, right? In-house, you know, like Buzzstream, I feel like maybe has a pretty good mix of in-house customers and agency customers using Buzzstream to do digital PR and link building. But I feel like in my experience, selling digital PR to an in-house is maybe easier from an agency and you don't see a lot of in-house digital PRs. Mm -hmm. I guess it depends on the size of the company, right? But what made Kuru decide to go with a digital PR and like bring you in house and, and run these campaigns. Yeah. So as you mentioned in the beginning, Kuru is not a hugely known company, right? Like maybe Hoka, well, definitely like Hoka, Mm -hmm. other household names. So a lot of our strategy on Mark, and I said, as I said before, sorry, is that we're an e-commerce site. You can't walk into REI or any of those stores and see us and try us on. So we are like heavily on marketing online, whether it's like influencer, social, paid search. And we do have a lot of emphasis on organic search and organic traffic. So we really are invested in, we want to rank for terms, you know, like best shoes for foot pain or best shoes for plantar fasciitis, things like that, best shoes for sore feet. So we're kind of looking to try and rank for terms like that to bring in our customers who do have foot pain. So in saying that, I work really closely with the whole marketing team and the SEO side here because we are, we're we're trying to, a lot of our strategy I would say is built around the helpful content update. A lot of that about, we're not just here to sell you shoes. We have a really robust blog that is, uh, you know, we have like, like I said, podiatrists review our pages and and uh, doctors as well. So we have this robust blog that's also really helpful. You know, you can go on there and find out ways to like help your plantar fasciitis, help your foot pain, you know, even things like the best songs for like running for the summer or like places you want to go hike. So that's kind of how we tie in digital PR and SEO is we're trying to earn links to help us with those kinds of things to be a helpful resource, not just a a sales site. Um, Yeah. And I also think a lot of it is brand awareness. I know that's that's one of those spots where traditional PR and digital PR kind of overlap in a funny way that I think we haven't all quite figured out while the two, the two industries are kind of merging, but also kind of don't want to. But 
Who are like not a household name. So part of my job is is getting our name out there and getting journalists to see credibility in us, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like it, that makes sense now, like why they would invest in digital PR. Of course, you are all digital. So it's just like, why not get as many kind of uh, strategies out there as you can? And you mentioned working closely with SEO. Um, do you have like a brand team as well? So we have a marketing team and being a pretty small company and a pretty small marketing team, uh, I work with one person on SEO and then I'm obviously owning all of digital PR and I guess the link building side, but I try to be super tapped into, you know, what are we ranking for? What are we trying to rank for? What position are we for this? Monitoring all the different Google algorithm updates. You know, I know one, it's so funny. I know one went out kind of recently. Um, it's August right now. I'm not sure when this will come out, but this with it being August, one went out recently and we also did a site migration on the same day. So we oh. are like, can you believe what happens? And like, that was just kind of a bad coincidence because yeah. we don't know what's going <laughs> to impact our site. But, you know, I really try and stay on top of that. I think that's one of those like kind of blessings with being in-house is that you get a lot of sight into how the, how the whole site is doing from an SEO mm. standpoint rankings staying on top of algorithm updates yeah 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 and that brings up a good point too of like working in tandem right with a lot of these other avenues and you get seo uh, there's like advertising influencer marketing i did want to ask you kind of more about your you know there's this senior digital pr slash influencer marketing specialist do you do uh, influencer marketing much? How about, and I'm curious how that kind of crosses over with digital PR. Yeah. So when I'd started this role almost two years ago, I had never really done anything with influencer marketing. And it really came down to, like I said, we have a pretty small team. So a lot of us wear a few hats. I think it's a wonderful opportunity to learn another skill set. So I really enjoyed it. I would say if I'm talking about how I split kind of my time and my role, I am mostly like maybe 80% focused on digital PR with 20% being over gifted influencer. And then we have someone oh, else yeah. who are paying influencers. So it's a pretty separate thing. I will say it's helped me be a better market marketer because I have to understand so much more about our customer base when I'm looking at influencers like age, you know, a lot of influencers are really young, for example, where our customer base skews older because they have foot pain. So oh, I see. things like understanding, yeah, I know it's pretty separate, but just things like understanding our audience, I think helps, just really helps, has helped in that way. Um, I do just want to, I guess, say with that as digital PRs, our audience are not customers and our goal is not to sell, right? Our audience are journalists and the media and our goal is to earn coverage. So it's kind of a bit of a switch in my brain of trying to you know, be on those different sides, but it's been really fun. I really enjoy it. It's a completely new thing to me. Yeah. Yeah. I've never done really much in the influencer realm of things. I can, I can see how they kind of play well with each other. You did say something interesting there at the end where, you know, the goal of digital PR, at least for you here is the end result is getting coverage from journalists, not necessarily selling shoes. Let's expand on that a little bit, because I know like some people might disagree that like at the end of the day, all marketing you want to sell, right? And like, obviously the goal is to get journalists covered, which will get you backlinks, which can help you rank and help the pages rank and everything. But I think there's probably a happy medium there, right? Where you're all the content you're creating has to do with, you know, it's, it's going to get your product in front of, of people and readers and stuff too. So like they do meet up at some point, but yeah, uh, l let's expand on that a little bit. I'm, I'm just curious, like where you've kind of rubbed up against those, those issues. Yeah, that's so true. I kind of didn't even think about that in that way until you said it of like, it's because I think as digital PRs, sometimes the rest of the team, this is definitely maybe an in-house thing more than an agency side thing, but sometimes the rest of the team, their right, their goal is ultimately to sell and to appeal to our audience. Whereas mine, like I just said, is very much journalists are my audience. And I actually think you're right in that if you actually do zoom out a bit, it's true, really at the end of the day, I am trying to make sales and build the brand and get brand awareness so that we do make more sales. So that's 
like a really interesting way. I honestly hadn't really <laughs> reached for me. I'm like, oh yeah, it's like so obvious, but I never thought about it, you know? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, to, to your point, like that is not the danger. It's like, but, but that happens in house. It's easy. And I've felt that on the agency too. Like if you're, you can be so focused on specific goals that you have as an agency that like sometimes the communication just isn't there. Yeah. And so like when you're in-house, sometimes it's, it's easy to get kind of hyper-focused on the goals. And it sounds like you do a great job of making sure that you're relevant. And like, that's the, the way to make all those lines connect, I think, at least in my experience. But yeah, that is a really good point. It's <laughs> the, your reaction the way proves that, that that happens. Yeah, I think, like you said, keeping things relevant to your brand is so important. Knowing that when you're in-house as the digital PR person, you're often the one giving quotes to media or connecting media with, say, experts. And so you kind of also do become that traditional PR representative in a way as well. Um, and so I guess that's why I think so heavily on journalists being my audience. And of course, I'm writing pitches like all the time that I want to look at from their perspective and have them see, right? Um, I also wanted to just give some tips for if you are kind of in that same in that same spot and how to make sure your campaigns aren't reading like ads or also really aren't reading like just so not connected to your brand and too irrelevant. So some of the ways I did that when I kind of took a step back after getting, going back to the email from those reporters is like taking a step back, I went and looked at all my campaigns and I one thing I think we really all as digital PRs really need to do is make sure that your methodology is really, really solid. I think that that's another way to be credible because one example I'll give is Wallet Hub. Have you ever tried to go and like reverse engineer a Wallet Hub campaign? I mean, they have probably sometimes upwards of 20 or 30 different campaign, uh, sorry, different data points. And each way is like a 1.2% or a 7.5% or something. And I think when you're Wallet Hub and you have that brand, um, that brand recognition and that credibility, like they can do that. I think with a brand like Kuru, that's so small and maybe it's even the first time these journalists are hearing about it. I try not to overcomplicate my methodologies too much at all. I try and keep them simple. I think the most I have is five data points in one campaign, um, each worth 20 points. You add it up to a hundred, super simple because I don't want anyone to look at my methodologies and think that is so complicated. They may as well have just made it up. You know what I mean? Um, right. You're like coloring the data to your story you know, versus the other way around. Yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. So I think, yeah. <laughs> you know, I think Wallet Hub can do that. And I, I fully believe that they'd have like a full team who can do that kind of really, really detailed methodologies. But I think it's important to always keep your methodology super clear super straightforward. Otherwise, a journalist might just distrust you. I also think if you're in-house and you look at your campaign page, make sure that there's no, you know, shop, shop women's shoes now, shop men's shoes now. None of those ads or what we call in-house, we call them CTAs. But the only one I will absolutely kind of allow on a campaign is to sign up for our newsletter. If anyone like way at the mm -hmm. bottom, yeah. alone methodology, like, I want this, I do not want anything that's going to give a journalist an inkling that this is any kind of ad. So let's remove, you know, any kind of banner, any kind of ad, right? Um, we want it to just look like it's just a report page. And then... Interesting. Do um, you keep the, do you keep the, um, like, the navigation links in there as well? Like, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. I feel like, yeah, right. That's going to just do the heavy lifting, the internal linking. Yeah, yeah. That makes sense. Um, yeah, keeping the the layout so it still looks good, but, you know, it still looks like our website, but I'm like pretty much, I'm always trying to be open to other people's, you know, ideas and everything. But I really do think that putting those kinds of ads or call to actions on the page does make it look too much like an ad. Um, and then, you know, the other thing I've done to really help with this and make sure, make it just really clear that I'm not just this person setting out ads is... At the end of my pitches, I'll put a line like, thank you for considering covering this report, or I think your audience would really resonate with this report. So I think 
sometimes putting that in even just shows this is a report that you or that the goal is earned media coverage without saying it right instead of just saying and if you want to buy kurus go here right right <laughs> yeah it's like a gentle nudge right right to yes, <laughs> remind them yeah that, that makes total sense i often wonder like yeah, you see digital PR sometimes, and this is maybe a little dated at this point, but like the micro site approach, I used to not like that approach and still am kind of a little wary on it because they typically don't match the website, like the, the main website, right? Like, and that's why I asked about like the navigation, because I think that's such an important thing. So if the user doesn't all of a sudden feel like, Hey, this is like, this is a different site with, you know, um, yeah. Getting back to that, like tying it all together back to selling shoes ultimately, right? Mm -hmm. So you talked about getting feedback from journalists. Mm -hmm. You said that you used to, or you still do, pay journalists for feedback on pitches or story ideas. Can you talk about, a little bit more about that? Yeah, for sure. That was actually a couple roles ago. So it's not in my current role, but we had a, essentially we built an advisory board where we had, I think, three current working journalists and we would send them, I think it was once a quarter, a bunch of pitches and then any campaigns that didn't really do well and say, why do you think this didn't do well? Um, I think it's easy enough for us, like you said, to have done postmortems and even look at things that did do well and say, cool, this is clearly what worked from that. Let's take that to the next thing. But having a group of journalists uh, as like an advisory board that we could get feedback and say, this is what we specifically want feedback on was like a pretty cool, a pretty cool initiative. I think, yeah, yeah, a really interesting way to get advice, like straight from the horse's mouth. Yeah. Th this was at Kuru or a uh, different? That was at Clearlink where I was two jobs ago. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Yeah. 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 I feel like that's something like every agency should try to do. I feel like it's probably like budgetary concerns when you get in-house, like just yeah. to borrow a team. Right. Um, I'm surprised. There might even be somebody that has like that service or something already. But yeah, I really like that idea. Another thing that kind of comes to mind when you talk about working in-house, sounds like you do keep busy in as much as like your ideation because you are constantly kind of forced. I think you said like you force to kind of always be thinking how to like push the envelope and, and stay creative. That was the one thing I was going to ask is like, you know, in-house versus agency. Um, for me, agency, the benefit was always you got to work on different clients. You were, you know, like you could dip your feet in different industries and it, you know, didn't get too boring and like working in-house, I could imagine after a few years, you'd be like, all right, you know, I've had enough of shoes. So like, how do you recommend, how do you personally like keep things interesting working in-house versus when you were an agency? Yeah, for sure. I've got a few different ways. Um. To be honest, one of my favorite aspects of working at an agency was being across all different industries. I would, you know, for half a day, spend spend half a day on a campaign about pets and then spend the other half of the day on a client about coffee. And then the next day, do like every state's favorite restaurant? Like that was really fun and cool to like jump around. Um, and I do think when you work in-house on one website for a long time you get so stuck in this cycle of like thinking the same way and thinking it has to be the same formula the same topics so I think that um one thing you can do is you can or one thing I've been trying to do a little bit is using chat GPT you know I might say what are some topics around this I haven't done a ton of that and I I do want to get really a bit more nitty gritty with like maybe even foot pain and see if there is I because I'm sure there's some topic or campaign idea I haven't thought of that I could try um another thing I think is is really important is um I love the grapevine newsletter um just seeing hundreds of different campaigns every month I always sit down and I build out probably you can even put time on your calendar I used to do that put it put a hour every Friday where you are just looking at digital PR inspiration. You are just looking at what that other, what other agencies are doing and take their campaigns and think, how can I adapt that to my client? So I'm, oh, I can talk about the, I did this uh, campaign where we use AI to visualize like every state as a shoe, kind of a interesting out there thing. I loved it. 
Um, and I got that idea from another agency, which I cannot remember who they are. So I'm so sorry, but they did every state. Like they use AI to make a Barbie house for every state. Oh, <laughs> Gosh, that's out there, but it's creative and it's so different and it's really cool. And so I kind of was like, cool, how can I take that and adapt that for my client? Um, the other thing, which I think is really great, I learned from Mark Johnstone back in 2020, is you know him, he suggested this activity that you do with your whole team and it's a mind map, which sounds really simple, but get your whole team, like marketing. If you are like me, where you're the only digital PR person, like get the whole team in set up a brainstorm and do a mind map. And you will be absolutely shocked how many different topics fit into like, if I start with shoes, that could go to sports, that could go to foot pain, that could go to walking, that could go to, I don't know, like summer festival, travel, and then just keep going and go like as nitty gritty as you can on each of these. And you will be absolutely shocked. There's probably like a hundred different topics you could make a campaign around and you just, you get just so stuck in like cool states for hiking. Uh, you know what I mean? And stuff like that. So I highly recommend doing that. Um, yeah. I, as you're talking, I'm trying to pull up. I just did a post on AI tools for PRs and there was one <laughs> called ideamap.ai. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it does exactly that. It's like a brainstorming tool where you can, uh, you put in like, you know, shoes and then all of a sudden it'll you know, pull out like whatever, and it's all chat GPT run or, um, or open AI run, I guess I should say, but that, yeah, I, I love the mind map that that was always super surprising to me too. Like working in the agency, all of a sudden you're like, wow, I didn't even think of this topic from that angle, right? Everybody brings their own history and stuff to it. And yeah, that, that is definitely where I've seen chat GPT as like a very good resource for, for PRs and like content creation is just brainstorming. It's basically just like having that friend that you're like, you know, you can just constantly sit there and be like, give me more ideas. Give me more ideas. Give me more ideas. <laughs> especially as weird as it sounds, especially being, you know, as being in-house and being the only digital PR specialist, sometimes that is like having coworkers that you're bouncing off of. Right. And like that, just having that other voice that's just not you really, really helps. So I'd always say, take a step back, look at what other people in the industry are doing, create a swipe file, which is like a Pinterest board, or even just a folder on your phone where you screenshot everything that inspires you. And that could even be ads. Like it doesn't even have to be digital PR content. It could just be ads that you see and think, wow, that's great. And that really caught my attention. And that particular topic like evokes a lot of emotion in me and that would make me stop scrolling if I was on my phone and so think about that kind of stuff and let yourself just have like creative time I think we hear a lot of jokes that like I always get my best ideas when I'm falling asleep or when I'm in the shower when I'm sleeping it's because that's your brain is switched off and it's allowing it's allowing your brain to process all the creative and amazing stuff that you've seen and so you're coming up with these ideas so just have a swipe file, have somewhere you keep what you like and what you've seen is inspiring that you can revisit. And also write down every like idea that comes to you because maybe it's not the perfect idea, but maybe once you take it to a brainstorm or sit on it for a few weeks, it will become a really good idea. Yeah, such great advice. I need to ask what a swipe file is. Is that a oh, no, map sure. swipe? Uh, no, so it's actually just kind of the name of like maybe a folder that you keep your inspiration in. So Oh, got it. Yeah, I got the idea again from Mark Johnstone. He's great. And he basically showed us, you can set up a Pinterest board, just call it swipe file, install the Chrome extension to Pinterest, and you can just save any image on the internet straight to it. And then you just got all this digital PR inspiration in one spot. It's amazing. Yeah. You know, again, I'm like looking back, I used to have a really cool plugin. I don't think I have it anymore, but it was just for that. And it, totally blacking on name it was like pin something pin board but i looked it up that's not what it is oh is it flipboard there was something where you could just pin whatever page you were looking at and like come back and like read it later um yeah. and i i used to have one of those just for that reason where you're just like okay this is interesting i'm gonna come back and like during my five or ten minute or, or hour that you have set aside to like find inspiration like then i just go through those um, I love that idea too. Just setting aside time, 
to actually enjoy, you know, and get inspired. Um, I, I used to, to, when we do training and stuff at Siege, I'd always tell new people to do that. Cause yeah, yeah. especially when you're in-house of a small team, like you said, it, it can be tough. Yeah. If you don't have people to bounce your ideas off of, I find that working remotely, like, you know, we have Slack, but it can be tough sometimes to, uh, to stay, not to stay motivated, but to like have that creative, those creative juices flowing all mm -hmm. the time. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, I also think if you have friends in the digital PR industry, or you can even reach out to like me or just anyone, um, even at other agencies or brands or clients, you can set up like a one hour Zoom or even just send a Google Doc if you're in different time zones and just say, you know, I've jotted down some ideas. I like them. I feel like they're 90% there, but maybe something's missing. Or, you know, this one might, I just need a bit of a gut check on this one. You know, this one idea, I'm not really sure how that might come across. Is it too far? Is it not relevant enough? And just kind of call in one of those favors, maybe once a quarter from someone else or every few months from someone else, you know, in the industry and then be there and be willing to help them. You know, it's, I've even just in group, you know, group chats just sent, Hey, I've got this idea. It's a little bit out there. Is this like too out there? And then send it to them. And most of the time people I know are like, no, that's awesome. I'm kind of like, well, I don't know. Um, but I think having just set up a network and, you know, it can, it can be a bit tricky, obviously, but if you can return the favor for them at some other point, I think that can be really helpful just to leverage. I think one thing about our industry is even though we're all kind of weirdly competing, we all also are so just, I don't know, we're like all on the same team. I think yeah. when I go to Brian SEO, there is no like, oh, they work for that agency, so I'm not going to talk to them. Like we right. all help each other. We all hide each other up on Twitter and LinkedIn. So I love to see that we have a really good community. And I really doubt if you went to someone and said, you know, can you just help me that they'd say like, no. Um, even just one thing we also used to do is literally make a doc of like, 20 to 30 campaign ideas, send it to a few people and say, can you just anonymously vote on your favorites? And they put a little asterisk or an emoji next to it. And then you can go the next day and see, you know, one idea has like five votes. So cool. That's one that people really like, like things like that. You can always just lean on the community. There's always someone who will help you. Yeah. Yeah. That's a further push. I, I want to set something like that up. I've been meaning to do it for like Buzzstream users just because I'm always interested in what people are working on too. And like, it's a good way to get that stuff out there. I feel like sharing content that you create is something that some agencies do a lot of. And obviously like there's, you know, NDAs and stuff. So they like the, the yeah. clients don't like to the, uh, have their stuff uh, shown and, and, and shared. But I think that it's a great way to get feedback, like you said, but then also, I mean, it can lead to link sometimes too, like getting, like, I see a lot of people just sharing, you know, you get on the grapevine newsletter, you get on, um, PR insider and like those types of kind of roundup posts that can then, you know, you, next thing you know, you're on some digital PR examples, blog post that somebody writes, you know, um, yeah. yeah. So there are definitely like some added benefits. We are hesitant to share things like if you, if it's not because of an NDA you just don't feel like you're going to get value out of it. I think there is a lot of value, like you said, building that network up. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Victoria, I want to ask one kind of final question yeah. that I used to think about a lot, obviously, like when I worked at Siege Media, one of the big things that we struggled with, or not struggled with, but you know, um, it was part of the growing process. I think when I joined Siege, it was like 12 people. By the time I left, it was like hundred people. So. We had to constantly think about ways to train new hires, bring in new hires, where to bring them from. Do we want to hire senior people, you know, junior people? And it got me thinking about your situation, you know, working in-house versus at an agency. If you were just starting out, if you had recommendations for people just starting out, or they wanted to get into digital PR, would you recommend the in-house route or recommend the agency? Yeah. So this is a really tough question and I've thought a lot about it. The too long didn't read is, is I'm going to say it depends, but I'll tell you why <laughs> not to be annoying, but so for context, you know, I started in-house, I was in-house for like four years. I went to an agency for nine months and I said, this is just not for me. And I moved back to an in-house role. So I definitely 
have a bias in the advice to give. I would say when you work in-house, the pros are that you have a lot more visibility and a lot more ownership to, as like with the marketing team and the website as a whole. I am looking at keyword rankings. I'm looking at traffic. I'm looking at brand awareness. I'm looking at backlinks. And so I can see the real impact of my work over a long time. When I was at Clearlink, I was on one website for two or three years and I got to see the domain rank go up. I got to see the uh, linking or referring domains go up over years. And I think that's really rewarding and really cool to be able to say, hey, this is how digital PR can really benefit a website or a brand. At the same time, at an agency, if you go in brand new, you're going to learn from like really, really great people. Like there are so many incredible digital PRs I know who are at agencies. And I think that going into a role like mine right now, where you are the only digital PR specialist, if you were brand new and you really didn't really have anyone else to bounce ideas off of or learn from, or even learn how to do digital PR, I think that would be really difficult. So I think I would say go to an agency and do one to two years where you are really going to learn a lot from like really great people. And I think that then maybe looking in-house or looking for an in-house role would be a great next step. So you can kind of just feel like you're more part of the brand rather than kind of like dropping in, building links and then leaving. That was like my experience at an agency. It was very much these short-term contracts, very much no, um, or very little collaboration with the SEO team and literally just building links and saying, here's how many links we built. I think that you can learn a lot about SEO and marketing from being in-house. So I will say the other, the only other pros and cons I want to mention is I know at agencies, some things like something that really was hard for me was like time tracking and having to bill time to clients. We tracked our time in 15 minute increments. I'm not sure if that's the industry standard, like, again, I just want to give that caveat. I was only at one agency for nine months, so I'm not entirely sure what's completely normal, but tracking time, uh, dealing with kind of things like we were told a certain percent of your time has to be on client work, but then there weren't enough clients. So sometimes that can be, it can be like a bit dicey with like how much work they have versus how much they don't. And then I also think, um, just like one last thing to consider. Again, this is only my experience. And, you know, at the end of the day, I think when it comes to looking for a job, you have to consider the entire thing. Uh, the entire package benefits everything when looking for a job. And I found when I was at an agency, it was a really small business. And this might sound a bit silly, but like the health insurance was like $500 a month. Whereas when I worked in house, my insurance wing with a bigger company, has them like 50 to a hundred dollars a month. And I know that sounds a bit like obscure to bring up on a digital PR podcast, but I do want to say like, you know, a job is not just, you know, it's not just, is it agency or in-house? There's so many different factors to consider what's best for you. And the size of a company really matters. And at the end of the day, it's a job we're all doing to get paid. And I think you can hear some agency horror stories. You can hear some in-house horror stories. You can meet some of the smartest people in an agency. You can meet some of the smartest people in-house. So whatever's best for you. But I, I definitely could see spending the first few years at an agency learning being really helpful. Yeah, I felt the same exact way. You touch on a lot of stuff there with working at an agency. Um, I never liked the time allocation and, and I feel just it's a lot more free when you're working in house, you can kind of, uh, dig, you know, deeper into certain areas that you want. And, um, but you know, that's, I also worked in agency for six years and, and I liked most of it. So, you know, it might've just been time for me to move. But the, the one last thing that I thought was really interesting that you said was, um, this idea of like digital PR and traditional kind of the lines melding a bit and blurring these days. And for whatever that's worth, um, I, I think it would just might be interesting to hear from you, like where you think the industry is heading, especially working in house and, and, you know, being able to see this from the ground level, um, what does the future of PR in general, 
uh, look like to you from, from that context of like traditional versus digital? Whew. I think, I think they're both heading to being one. I think that when you are the digital PR person, you kind of also are the PR person. You are representing the brand. You've got your name and face associated with the brand. Um, you are earning awareness and earning placement. So I do think if you're new to digital PR or even if you've been in the industry, it's good to prepare for knowing that it's not just link building. It is very much an all round being a PR representative of a brand and of a website. I think I have done, you know, I've done TV interviews. I've done, you know, uh, radio. I've done all kinds of things on behalf of a brand. And when I do provide a quote, I am quoted as the spokesperson of the brand. So I really think that's where it's headed is it's all headed toward one. And I think it's kind of hard. I've never had any training or really experience in like traditional PR, but I do see that there's just so much focus on these, especially top tier publications around their own SEO and affiliate links that it's definitely headed that digital way. And that as they're learning more about SEO and links and no follows and do follows, um, you know, they're, they're learning that too. And so that has to just become a part of the PR's job, I think. Um, you know, back when I started in 2018, I could you could tell a lot of top tier publications really didn't have an SEO strategy or they and they just put links in. Now there's like a lot of top tier places who say we have like a no link policy or a no follow only and they only their only do follows are inter, uh, internal links. So they've cottoned on and they're cottoning on to affiliate <laughs> affiliate links and everything like that. So I think the more is any kind of PR role, traditional, digital, the more you can learn and understand about SEO, understand journalists and what they're going through and dealing with, with they need traffic, they need clicks. Um, yeah, I think they were just merging into one with even a slight more emphasis on SEO and, and digital. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, great answer. I, I, It'll be really interesting to see how things play out. I mean, bringing up like the no follow links and like the publications kind of catching on, you know, there's still like the Google, the Google of it all, where it's like, is Google also, you know, giving preferential treatment to publishers? And so, yeah, it'll be interesting to see, but I love that idea of like any PR position needs to kind of be aware of the whole landscape. Yeah. It's not just digital may touch TV or, or vice versa. I feel like that's probably the, the closest line there, but you know, radio billboard, pr like print ads and stuff. Like I've had people where you pitch something and they're like, can, what, can I put a, this article in my print magazine? You're like, yes, <laughs> <Sure. laughs> it's really helped me like from a link perspective, but like a brand yeah. perspective. Yeah. Like when you're thinking of the big picture. So yeah, Victoria, this has been great. Thank you so much for giving up some of your time. I want to remind people, check out Victoria on LinkedIn. Her ex Twitter profile uh, is Victoria Schmid. So it's uh, B-I-C-P-O-R-I-A-S-C-H-M-I-D. We can go then, uh, Yeah, cool. And then, yeah, check out Kuru. It's just kurufootwear.com. Um, and you can check out the stuff that Victoria's working in on the blog. So just kurufootlawyer.com slash blog. Check out, um, she wrote a great case study for us about her airport, the walking. airports with the longest walking distance. Yeah, yeah, really creative campaign and uh, did really well. So I'll definitely link to that in the show notes. But yeah, thanks again, Victoria, for all your time. I really Perfect. appreciate having you on. Yeah, perfect. Thank you so much. And anyone who has any questions, feel free to message me on LinkedIn. I'm I'm super passionate about helping others in the industry, especially newbies who are coming up. So please feel free anytime to reach out to me. And thank you so much for having me. Yeah. And just a quick reminder, like, subscribe. Uh, like Victoria said, hit us up in the comments if you have questions for her, questions for us. Um, we're happy to answer. Like she said, it's a community here. So trying to uh, support each other however we can. So thanks again. Take care.